as a problem. Maybe we'll satisfy my eyes as uh, that um, Matthew, who also works with that got very fine, and it's supposed to be on every slide, but I screwed the thing up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just on that one. So, good one. I started in the industry about 12 years ago, um, actually in Florida, and I actually had a good person in the industry because it was very good. Um, I worked on Rugby League 2, and then Jackass, and then I Ran away to Norway to make flash games for a couple of years. Then um, that company went under. And I found myself in London um, with the North Studios making Batman games, which was definitely the career highlight. Uh, I worked on uh, HUD, the, 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 the in game aspect of the UI, um, as well as other uh, things. Forensics, mini games, and in Batman Arkham City, I uh, did the AI for the free spot spot. Um, after six years there, um, and then one part of life and two children, we uh, moved back to New Zealand and started back at Shane Director, which is a remarkable flip pop. And um, since then, the last year and a half, I've been working on one of the stars called Football. Um, so, making an AI <laughs> making an AI that can make humans is usually pretty easy, especially if there's physics or if there's probability because humans aren't real good at physics and probability. We can do the maths, but we do it very slow. Um, except for the really good players and the really pacifistic players, humans generally don't like being beaten by a robot. Who they can't understand. They need to understand why they're being beaten if they're being beaten. Um, so, so, this talk is going to be a few non technical lenses and principles that, that help create more compelling AI by making them feel more human. Humans won't necessarily mean making them more effective at beating the player. Unfortunately, um, I wasn't able to secure permission uh, to show or refer to any of the stuff that I did on the Batman games. So, this will be a combination of insights from Rival Stars College Football and sort of generic uh, AI concepts that can apply to any virtual action adventure that can be given into the game. So, I'm going to begin with the most important AI thing of all, according to me based on a narrative and cinematic experience. Um, talk a little bit about action adventure AI aspects, uh, starting with the general gameplay and then the boss stuff, which we want to be useful. And then I um, want to talk about why we start to football. First I want to talk about how we're at the football, because New Zealanders, if we don't know anything about the football, I think we're going to so I'll uh, do an overview of the Rival Stars College Football and then um, talk about how an AI can handle statistical play those decisions. And I'll sum up all of what I would cautiously, perhaps unrealistically, the all my own stuff. So the most important thing is that AI have to seem like they are playing fair, that they're not cheap. Um, Players hate when AI is cheap. If you're playing RTS, or your own strategy, versus a bot, and you build a really clever base somewhere in the out of the way place, you expect the, 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 the bot to fall for your trap, to be caught out. If they make a beeline straight for your hidden base with all of the units that they need to counter your defenses, that sucks. Um, if you're playing a fighting game, you expect the, the AI to respond to your attacks, and perhaps even to respond faster than a human would respond to But if it seems like they're responding to your inputs before the attack animations are even starting to play, that sucks. Even you would accept that from a human responding to the way you play. Um, if you're playing a digital trading card game, you expect the AI not to look at your hand, not to sort of reach up with your head when you don't want it to, not to go through your deck working out what you've got planned. 
if the way that they play suggests that they are cheating, that's all. And the key is, it's all about the appearance of cheating. If you, as a person developer, create a really clever AI that is following the perfectly reasonable rules about what information it can access, but because you're clever, you figure out what the user is probably doing, and you cut them off at every point and defeat their every strategy in a totally fair way. You will be accused of cheating. And that's something that's about you're too clever, and they accuse you of cheating. When you like that, <coughs> really hard to argue with that. Um, so it's not shopping. Um, if you've got a projectile weapon, something that's shooting things at an observable speed, like a rocket launcher or a sack full of grenades, and you've got a moving target, it's really easy to intercept. The, the mass is simple. If you're a computer, you can do it in a fraction of a frame. Um, but we know from movies that that's not how it works. If the hero is one, the enemies should be once. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, who are you going to trust? Kinematic equations or random? Kinematic equations don't say BFWs. Um, so, what do you do? If you want to have a cinematic narrative, which is often the case when you're on, on easier difficult levels, then you can make your AI small in the uptake. Um, rather than having them directly perceive the, the player's velocity. They can maintain a perceived velocity vector, and you can have that move towards what the player is actually doing over a second or two. Uh, if the player does just run and spread the line for a long time, eventually they will figure out their velocity and they'll be able to But if the, if the, if the player keeps moving, the AI will nearly catch up fully, and the player will feel like they're dodging bullets. Um, so, I mean, I've made worse diagrams. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you're hunting a dude that hides you. The dude is the green line. And you duck behind some cover. And you've got the sack full of grenades from the previous slide. Where do you toss it? Do you throw away your walls? Because you know he was, <laughs> but you know he's not there anymore. Would well, you assume that he's kept on running for a meter or two and then crouched down a line cover and drop it exactly where you think he's going to be? Or you just not worry about the grenades at all? Assume he's going to keep on running, keep the timing right, and just empty your machine gun right at the point where he's going to emerge, right at the point where he comes out. Um, those second two options are really sensible. They're technically a good idea. And they feel unfair to players. Um, if you drop a grenade exactly on their head because they've stopped in a really predictable place, they will think you're cheating. <laughs> Likewise, if you stop shooting and then shoot them just as they come out, it's like, how could you attract me? I was behind them, you couldn't see me, you actually did. Um, but they'll accept that from a human. Um, so what do you do? For a cinematic experience, maybe aim near the player. Maybe even cheat to find out where they are and drop them further away. Cheating's <laughs> 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 okay, they, they don't feel like you're cheating. Let's keep some pressure on. They've got a, they've got a grenade exploding right them. They feel vulnerable, but it also empowers them for the act of seeking cover because they haven't just been beamed in place with a grenade. But, what if you do want your AIs to come across as, as smarter than a brigade of generically scored in 80s experts? What if you want them to cut them off, cut the, the, the player off the pass, and, and blow up the hiding places, and cut out the options? Well, what else do they do in movies? They talk, they talk constantly about their opinions. Um, so, Mr. Hero, you think you can hide from me? 
Did you forget that I was also raised, that I was raised from childhood in this volcanic area, and that I have a big sack of grenades, and I know where all of the hiding places are? So if you tell the player how you're doing the thing that feels like cheating, it stops feeling like cheating. If you make it clear that the AI is playing fair, the player will accept the things that they're, that they're doing. But you can also throw in hints to guide the player towards what they should be doing to again defeat the way that the AI is adapting to them. If you've spotted that they keep on doing the same thing over and over again, like disappearing into the darkness and sneaking around, you can, you can have your AI talk about this. You can have them discuss, oh, she's gone into the darkness again, quick, turn on the lava pumps. Um, boss fights. Boss fights are a little bit different because you need to change up the game. It's a break from the regular gameplay. It's, it's an exclamation mark in the, in the narrative. Um, you've got some different axes of gameplay to, to, to play with, and finding a balance becomes a new challenge. So you've got familiarity versus, versus innovation. When you add in new mechanics, it can make it interesting, or it can can create a disconnect, because now the player feels like they're playing a completely different game. Um, and there's a cognitive cost to learning new things, especially if you're learning them under five. But you do need to change some, some things up to make it possible to be special. Um, you've got challenge versus accomplishment. You want the fact of the player to feel like they're being challenged, that their, their skills are being tested. But because this is an exclamation mark in your narrative. You don't want it to last forever. You want it to be an exciting short-term thing, and you want them to win eventually without having to resort to the internet. Um, you may need your player to revisit gameplay techniques, like a particular style of war jumping that you haven't forced them to use recently. In which case, you have to remind them. You can have the NPC pop up and say, hey, remember about war jumping? That was the best. <laughs> you can have their, their tactical computer sort of chime in and say, I've got to analyze the situation. This boss is vulnerable to jumping off the wall or something. Intelligence versus predictability. This isn't a necessarily the case for all bosses. You expect the vomit to be done. But if you've got a boss who you've presented to the player as a tactician, then the player will expect her to behave cleverly. She, you want her to behave in a way that becomes smart and realistic, and to react to the player's actions in, in a way that's believably human and adaptive and, and feels challenging. At the same time, she has to be at least a bit predictable so that the player can learn how to defeat her. So, I want to talk about Rhino Stars College Football, but as I mentioned, and the Germans just don't know about American football, um, when I was growing up, the prevailing narrative was that American football is it's just rugby, but they wear armor because they're worms, and they need a little ball. And every couple of minutes they have a wee break so they can sit down and chat. <laughs> <laughs> That's not actually accurate. Um, so, 22 players on the field, each team fields 11 players um, from a pool of about 50, because they cycle quite a bit. They don't do any, um, any aerobic training. Like, the average American football player will run 100 metres at a time. They never sort of go for a 10k run like, like um, a rugby player, because they, they only ever do the first time. Like in the government. Um, <laughs> so you've got four downs to make 10 yards. A down has been offence and defence line up on the, the line of scrimmage. Um, offence tries to push the ball off field, defence tries to stop them. The down, the, the final play lasts until the ball is grounded or goes out of play. If you lose 10 yards, the downs count resets, you get another um, four downs to make another 10 yards. Um, if you fail to make your 10 yards, the ball gets handed over to the other team. 
and then you take it to the field, you get a touchdown, you score six points, and then you get to choose one of two conversions, either sort of step in that two yards, which is not my fault, and trying to run the ball back over the, the, the line for two points, or back on 15 yards, kicking through the yards for one point. Or you can get a field goal from anywhere on the field for three points. And all those players you just kick the ball as far as you can, surrender control of it, but hopefully make it harder for the other team. Right, so you now know everything you need to know about American football. <laughs> you know more than we did when we started making it. <laughs> um, so our game is a coach level simulation. Um, it's a very simplified version of the game that you can um, instead of 11 defensive players on the field, we've only got five and five defensive players. Um, you've got a playbook of eight plays compared to upwards of 100 for a real team. And each of those plays pairs three of your offensive uh, athletes. We use athletes rather than players and users rather than players. Players became a word that we wouldn't have to say in the team. Similarly, game, but it got confusing. So we would have the match, which is what you play inside the in rows, and we would have the app, which is what you're running from when you play. There are no players, the one in the athletes, who the players, and users who were the actual real humans. Um, we often forgot. <laughs> <laughs> So you play get three of your athletes with three defensive athletes. Um, and they compare their, their, their relative numbers and, and sort of one-on-one -on -one showdowns. Each showdown pushes your chances of success up or down. Um, we expose this information as pie chart, as um, numbers on the athletes, and you could play just by looking at the numbers. The intention was that that someone with real football knowledge will be able to intuit what's going to be a good idea, what, um, what makes sense in real world football. Um, the other team, which is created by a human, is not played by a human, it's played by an AI, and we wanted the AI to play as though they were human, to make sensible seeming football-like, realistic decisions. Which came back to the problem, we were all kids. We didn't have that football experience. We didn't have that bullshit detector to say that doesn't feel like football. We had one guy from Utah, he was a one guy. Uh, and it's not just the rules of football, it's not just the mechanics, it's the culture, it's the, 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 the feeling that we had to catch that in order to make it so. So we binge watched football games and get a whole lot of dogs and started wearing trucker caps. <laughs> then we uh, found some actual football fans, um, bought them in, got them to play our prototypes, bounce ideas off them, tell us what we were doing wrong. There was a lot. Um, <laughs> and eventually we got to a point where, where our users felt that our product was getting it right often enough. <laughs> So, how do I, how do we make it feel human? It's, um, because we've only got five athletes on the, on the field and the playbook of eight plays, decision space is actually pretty small. So we can take a brute force approach and run through all of the plays and silently test them. So we set up all of the offense versus defense clashes, resolve them, activate the, the athlete's skills, um, and then work out what the chance of a play succeeding or critically succeeding was. And then, knowing how, how many yards that play is expected to get, we can estimate what, how many yards will this play probably get. We will rank plays, given the scores based on the expected average. Then take those scores and, and modify them up or down based on how many yards we actually need. There's no point doing a 15 yard play that you're likely to fail if you only need two yards. Um, and by the time left in the game, if this is the second or the second to last play in the game, there's no point playing the safe. We need to push back. The, uh, the downs count is, is relevant. And also, 
what the relative scores are. If, if you're behind, you take more risks. If you're ahead, you, you, you play the safe. Um, having then ranked all of the plays and given them scores, we cut out the low ones um, because we don't want them to ever be used. We don't want users to say, look, that's ridiculous. No coach would ever make that play in that situation. Um, so, having, having, having got rid of the, the lower ones, we do a weighted random on the, the, the better ones. So, the really good ones, we're probably going to have. The ones that are yeah, possible, they might have. Um, and then what, what this did was that generally meant that the teams were, were picking plays that made sense to someone's football instinct. But very occasionally they'd, they'd, they'd do something that was, was unexpected. They'd, they'd do a, a long pass when a, an inside run was the obvious choice. But because it happened so rarely, the users interpreted that as, as the AI cycling them out, playing mind games, doing sensible things. <laughs> and then they opened the door to the user being, oh, maybe I can play mind games too. Maybe every so often play something that, is, that, that doesn't feel like the absolute optimal choice. And then when they do that, and the defensive AI, which follows the same rules as the offensive AI, except you can only see the plays that you've got used. So when the defensive AI chooses a defense for the optimal play, but you've gone for the suboptimal play, and that means that the, the defense, instead of helping them, makes them less effective. So you manage to trick the AI. And that feels awesome. Um, and, and we really created the illusion that the defensive AI, based on what we've already seen you play, what, um, you know, what, what play you already brought out, was thinking, hmm, what would I do from the human's point of view? Okay, so if I did that, what would be the appropriate counter? Um, and our users felt that the the uh, this was really convincing. It didn't win often enough to make it feel like they were being screwed, um, but it wasn't stupid often enough to make them feel like it was just playing random. Alright, so AIs have to feel like they're playing fair. If they're not playing fair, then the users don't have a um, And if, if it seems like they're cheating, if, if, if the AI is giving the impression that it's cheating, then you can use gameplay, you can use UI, you can use vocalization to show that you're not cheating. And you can do this even if you are cheating. <laughs> um, it's all about the narrative experience. Games can, can traverse decision space exhaustively in ways that users can't. It's, it's quite easy to work out your optimal, optimal um, action in any situation. But if you want the AI to feel human, they occasionally have to do something a bit dumb. But is it dumb? And maybe, maybe they're not being dumb, maybe they're just tricking you. And, and sort of creating that, that narrative for the, for the user, for the player, that there might be something deeper to the AI that they are that they, that they up to in my is really, really effective. You can explain that again, that I can't talk about. <laughs> um, and randomness is great. Randomness is great, if you use it too much, then it takes away its effect. Bit, means that, that you create a fear of unpredictability that can be disproportionate with how unpredictable the game actually is. If you think there's a chance that the AI might do something unpredictable, that's a lot more stressful, even when they're being very predictable. Um, I think that would take longer. 
which suggests that I've actually forgotten quite a lot of what I originally wrote. Um, which I will blame as a fluid And so I've, I've never used the word man flu non ironically before. <laughs> it was an experience. I should be myself. Um, questions? I think I'm probably going to talk about that as well. <laughs> Yeah. This, is, this is great. Did, did you ever wonder why you were making a game about a game that you didn't really make a game about? And why you were chosen to make a game that you didn't make a game about? So, so the question is, why would you, did I ever wonder why I was making a game about a real world game that I ended up doing about? Or why I was chosen to do it? And the simple answer is a cosmic boss told me to. <laughs> um, <laughs> The, the real answer is um, fantasy football um, is it makes a lot of money, um, but it's increasingly being cracked down on because it's basically gambling. So what we wanted to do is sort of exploit that, that, that niche of there are people who want to play a football-like game on their phone or on their computer. Um, and one of their current targets is about to disappear. Now, as it turns out, perhaps due to changes in American um, politics, it hasn't been cracked down as much as we thought it would. Uh, and then, as to why I and the other team, other people in the team may have, um, some of it's available. Who the team was actually available to do it? Um, the other is uh, had the AI background, um, had the time working on the rugby league games, way back at the start of my career, and just a general enthusiasm for I would like to do something interesting that I haven't done before. Um, and, uh, in the past, so, so Mario Lawrence, who's the, the, the director of uh, Okay, but back in the early days when I was working on Gene Director, I had a few run ins with him where I strongly disagreed with things that he said. Um, there was a, a jackass game in the middle, a uh, brown corruption where you have to take a, a lighter down a sewer. Um, and, and he was convinced that the, 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 way to, the way to operate the lighter should be pushed up and moved to right to steer it. And I thought it should be tank controls. It was a PSP, up and down on the left, uh, on the left, and the triangle and, and X on the right, to the right. And so this would make a better game, it would simply be more fun. There were many arguments, I lost them because he's the boss. Um, and I brought this up as an example when I was in the box here. And I heard that from disagreements with the manager. And then asked, so, were you right? Uh, no, I wasn't right. Um, making a game for me would be a terrible idea because there aren't enough needs in the world. <laughs> you need to go for what's going to work for most, most people. And, and that experience of getting things horribly wrong and realizing it afterwards counts for a lot. And I think that's why um, Mario is comfortable getting, getting these projects to, to our team and you know, several people who are senior on it. Because we've had that experience of making dumb assumptions, realizing it's wrong, and just going through the problem. Where did I go? Anyone else want to ask a question that I won't really answer? <laughs> What is your background in AI? And if there's an aspiring AI game programmer, what would you, what would you suggest they learn to? So, so it's not like you learned it on the trial AI on their own, but is there something more formal involved in doing what you doing? So the question was uh, what, what my background in AI is, and um, what I recommend to someone who wants to, to join the industry is a great Um So I did a neuroscience degree. Um, and that involved taking recordings from uh, 
the neurons of, of sharks and the sort of genesitized in, in a bucket. Um, and none of my work have worked together. I never managed to collect a single recording from a shark. So two weeks ago, before I had to hand in my, my thesis, I just thought I'd bugger it. Um, I will make a simulated shark. With, and, and because the sharks that we were recording from were, were decerebrate, they, they had a large chunk of their brains taken up. Um, my simulated sharks didn't have to be very smart. Um, they just responded to um, different levels of olfactory chemicals on the, on the different sides of their, 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 their faces. Um, so having completed my thesis, which was adequate and gone magically just, I realised that I didn't work with animals anymore um, because they go wrong. <laughs> Computers go wrong, they're at fault. And so I started doing more and more getting stuff in my, my spare time, working on the PlayStation 1, um, making a snake game with true monitor on a system that doesn't have any coding ones. And, and just sort of trying to build little basic AIs and the uh, um, But basically, I have no formal training in any AI other than sort of talking to other people in the AI when I was doing stuff that was in the AI. Um, and I will go on to a philosopher who has some funny opinions about AI. Um, When I was a rock steady, um, I don't honestly know why I was given the Mr. Freeze um, boss battle, but um, I think it was supposed to be this clever than it ended up being, but things kept on going right. Oh, good luck. Good luck by the side. I don't know, I mean, Advice for people now is very different to <coughs> advice for them. When I was in the industry 12 years ago, um, there's a so much more competition now. There's so much more expectation of, of experience working in Unity, doing your own um, homebrew stuff. Whereas for me, doing my own homebrew stuff was using some part of the development kit for the PlayStation 1 with a third party cartridge stuck into the back, which happened to be the same equipment that Chief Director had just bought for their four people. Um, and so I contacted them and talked to them and kind of lunch my way the industry. Um, I guess the advice for people who want to get into AI is make AI stuff. Um, Do projects, do short projects, and do them and, 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 and do them until it's quite clear that they're going to help you. Because they will. It's really hard to get, right, get, get things right. And you learn more from failing than from succeeding. Which is why I'm doing my job. How are you doing? Um, we have another 15 minutes in the world. 15 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> um, anybody? Yeah. Uh, so that's like the third time in this conference I've heard about this Mr. Freeze battle. Can you, can you talk about that one bit? I have never played it in this very experience. Well, I think the next question was tell me more about your amazing Mr. Freeze battle. <laughs> um, and uh, so the premise was, Mr. Freeze is really smart, Mr. Freeze has got um, you know, heavy armor, powerful weapons, Batman has to outsmart him using all of Batman's um, solid predator tricks. You can't go up and fight him directly because he's too tough, you have to sneak around, jump on him from behind, or hide in the vent and leap out, or jump over a fence as he goes below, or what. Use your electrical gun on generators on wall and call Mr. Freeze in and knock him down. And then we just ground him up and stuff him up in the And what we wanted to do was to. Not force, reward the player for revisiting all of the, the, the techniques that we taught them earlier in the game. And so each time you manage to damage Mr. Freeze, 
the shot down and leaving you dead to the damage. If you do a glide kick into him, he freezes the air so you can't glide anymore, even though that's not freezing the air. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> if you jump over a fence and then land on him, he's starts icing up on the fences so you can perch on him. If, he, um, if you jump through a window, he starts freezing up the windows. If you come up through a vent, he starts freezing up all the vents. He, he, fought, he rather than adapting his own tactics, he adapts his environment to shut down your, your um, abilities. And he feels smart. And one of the big challenges was telegraphing why he was doing the things he was doing. Or a country like that again, high control of the air, and things like that. Um, I'm pretty good in Chile. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, what was your approach in coding the early stages of the Mr. Freeze uh, battle? Okay, can't talk about it. I'm sure I can't. <laughs> what was my approach in coding the early stages of the Mr. Freeze battle? Um, so very basic level. Um, the first thing I wanted to do was was to have Mr. Freeze know about him, but know about the world. So rather than um, if you could see that man in chase him, you should be. You couldn't see that man. You had a list of all of the likely hiding places, and you start to sort of go from hiding place to hiding place, starting with the ones closest to where that was, looking for him. That was the, the, the whole I was raising this book in the video. Um, and it worked. But it didn't work that much. And so then there were lots of discussions about well, how can we how can we make it feel more epic, how can we make it feel more adaptive? What can what can Batman do to get the other hand? What can Freeze do to get the other hand? I want to see a lot of that. I want Batman's primary thing to be Mr. Freeze is all about the eyes. I'm going to set your house on fire. Um, we did. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't consistent with the way that the game had played before, and we really wanted to make it so this boss fight was a continuation of normal gameplay rather than a set piece where you had to learn a whole new set of rules and a whole new set of interactions. Yeah. Um, so you, you talk about this sort of relationship between the AI and the narrative, or is the AI and the general game design when it comes to a boss fight? What, what are the sort of characteristics of this boss personality wise, and how can they incorporate that into AI? I'm curious about that, because uh, end of Arkham Asylum, the Joker, for instance, narratively has been this sort of twisted. Uh, I can't screw that in over because of my strategy and my tactics. And at the end of Arkham Asylum, um, he basically turns into one of the same roided up jobs that you've already been fighting, and then you fight him. And narratively, it felt a little, you know, like that. that it, it, was, it was great, it was like a little boss fight. Um, but the narrative is a sort of strange to it. So, so I just wanted to ask about um, that conversation between game designers and, and narrative designers. Um, does the game design change the narrative, or have you had any experience of, of it being that way instead versus the narrative design saying we want this, this character, this boss to have the personality characters? If you could enlighten us on that process. Right, so the question there <laughs> was um, Joker at the end of the and so it was a really weird boss fight because suddenly he turned into a great big monster. What's up with AI versus narrative there? Um, I came in to Moxie two weeks before Arkham Asylum was supposed to show, and it worked on for three weeks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't involved in anything other than how to do that point. Um, so I don't, I don't know. I suspect that um, various different Boss fights were, were, were the boss concepts were tried. Um, there was certainly a case that um, later on we tried a lot of different things and we got rid of the, 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 the beast. Um, I suspect there was a compromise between um, the amount of time left on the project and the desire to have 
something to, to, to finish the game off. Um, 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 some bosses, some allies don't need to be defeated. And we're not like on the Sonic games, is, is a great example. The, the challenge is learning the, learning the patterns, not um, getting the feel for the, 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 the narrative of the character. Um, this would be the point that would be really helpful if I played the new games in about 10 years. But um, since, yeah, since my children were born, I pretty much just play Minecraft. If <laughs> 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 you play it carefully, it's a child friendly game. <laughs> The information of the dead crash is going to swear at you. You can't run off the cars because you need to steal more cars. You don't want to see anything there. But if you know, see yourself fun little games like, I'm sorry, this is the middle of the street. If you make your own games, I'd be like, I'm going to take that tractor right up to the top of that hill. And then I will try not to get killed by mountain lions on the way down. Examples of other AI bosses that have that sort of push, push the narrative. Um, the format doesn't want with, with, with the dialogue. Um, but generally, the format you can solve all of your problems by using them. Uh, so you can skip it with the dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> right, um, but I've one more question. Uh, I know it's really nice to hear what it's like. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, from an AI perspective, what's the difference between a single boss and just a freeze and a swarm of generic variants and having them work together? Um, so, the question is from the AI perspective, what's the difference between a single boss and a swarm of generic variants? Runs a song of boss. <laughs> <laughs> the, you can escalate it in different ways. As, as the individual minions get, get taken out, then predictably they don't pose so much of a challenge, but they can, can sort of ramp up their tactics to make it feel like a different challenge. They can start responding to the fact that they're friends and taking that by grouping up. Um, and, and so the, the gameplay landscape changes quite a lot from the point of the start where you've got all the enemies to a bit at the end where there's just one or two guys who are really pretty terrified by this point, possibly doing crazy things, um, or possibly just letting the difficulty ramp down so that you can enjoy that feeling of taking that. With some bosses, you'll be shooting off their, their weaponry and, and weakening them towards the, the end of the end of the fight, which will be quite similar to, to whittling down the weaponry the, the things. With others, you want your boss to get stronger and stronger as it goes on, so that the, the battle becomes more and more pitched, and you feel like you're just scraping through the, with your skill. Even though it's probably not your skill because the developers are cheating and making it so you're pretty much guaranteed to win once you get down to 10% health left. Right. Um, thank you for the extensive Q&A session. Right.